How you guys doing? Wow, this is a lot of people. Everyone doing good? You know, as I'm watching this video, I'm realizing that that's probably why my body feels the way it does right now. I'm realizing that all those people that said, doesn't skateboarding hit when I said no, that now it actually does. But praise God, amen, for being healed. I'm excited to be here. I'm blessed. I'm super encouraged. When Ian picked me up yesterday, he just began to share with me about liberty, about what is it, 70,000 students a year, and that all of you are here in the name of Jesus, or you're on your way to be in Jesus' name. And I want to share with you somewhat today about my life, but we're going to get into the word. Can you guys say the word? That's how we say it in England, that is in tongues. But let me just pray real quick. Lord, we lift you up, God. I thank you, Lord, for the worship today, for who you are. I pray right now, God, over every brick, every blade of grass, everything about this university, that Holy Spirit, you are here in our midst. You would speak to your people today, that, Lord, you would be high and lifted up. I thank you for the opportunity. I thank you for the things I went through, the things that you have done in my life and are going to do in others' lives in here, Lord. And I thank you for victory that we have in the cross. Lord, this is your time. Invade it. We plead the blood. In the name of Jesus, we say. And I bet all of you right now have one main question, right? Many of you are saying, where is this guy from? That is not prophetic. I just know. Is it Australia? Is it Germany? Where is it? But here's the reality. What country are we in? What language are we speaking? English. So you are the ones with the accent. I do not have an accent. The Bible says the truth will set you free. Amen? <laughs> Liberty University has an accent, but I'm just so encouraged being here, hearing the worship. I grew up in Liverpool, England. That's where I'm from. The Beatles, and I don't even know what else is from there, but um, I never imagined in my life that there would be a school or a place, the biggest Christian university in the world where people really hung out and talked about Jesus. See, I was raised five doors down from a church. Can you say church? In England, we spell church, C-H-E-R-C-H, church. Uh, <laughs> it's funny every time to me. It's still early in the day for a skateboarder. But I was raised five doors down from a church or a church. And I never heard about <laughs> church. <laughs> That's translating church for you. Gift of prophecy, interpretation. But I, <laughs> this is why I have notes, because I will end up all over the place. But I grew up five doors down from a huge church. <laughs> We're off to a good start, right? And it was a huge sandstone building, and there was all kinds of saints and funny gargoyles and all that kind of stuff. And I spent many years going to that church, but never as someone that knew Jesus. I went there to play with my G.I. Joes. I went there to play with my skateboard down the hill. And I went there to play this crazy sport that you kick with your foot and it's a ball. You kick it with your foot and it's a ball. What's it called? Football. 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 It's not the funny brown thing like a loaf of bread that you guys throw. <laughs> and I love Tim Tebow. Amen. I watched Jimmy Fallon doing Tim Tebow to Jesus Christ, right? Preaching Jesus on live television, God is good. But I went to that church, never hearing about Jesus. I played football in there, I skateboarded on my little toy, but I never knew about God. And what happened in my life was at the age of 13, I fell madly in love with something. I had a dream. How many of you guys have big dreams? Half of, well, maybe 5% of you. How many of you guys have little dreams? Well, what happened to me was at the age of about 12, I watched a movie that probably none of you have seen if you're under 30 called Police Academy 4. Okay, wow. Maybe you guys seen it on YouTube. And I watched Police Academy 4. I watched all these skateboarders doing all these crazy tricks. And I thought, there's no way this is real. This is stunts. This is Hollywood. This is insane. And then right before I was 13, I went on vacation to New Jersey. Wow. I got Jersey pride too. That's the first time I came to America. That's all of you and me and Snooky, right? Pray for her. Amen? L really? I went to New Jersey and I watched this guy roll up to a curb and jump up on the curb on a skateboard. I said, I can't believe this is real. 
My sister said, Brian, what do you want for your 13th birthday? I said, I want a skateboard. We went in the surf shop, bought a skateboard. I went back to England, got braces, had a funny haircut, got big baggy clothes, and I fell in love with skating, that was it. And all I did was I wanted to become a professional skateboarder. It wasn't to be famous, it wasn't to make a bunch of money, it was because like everyone else, I wanted free stuff. And so there's Brian, a bucktooth kid in Liverpool, England, skateboarding, wanting to live in America. This is his dream, this is his vision, this is what his life's about. It was the American dream. And what happened is back then there wasn't hundreds of thousands, there wasn't all these skateboarders, there wasn't thousands of pros, there was maybe a couple of hundred. So there's Brian in England pursuing his dream, never hearing about God. There's Brian jumping down stairs and handrails like you saw, and within just two years, who's the most famous skateboarder ever? Tony Hawk, within two or three years of pursuing my dream, I got a phone call from a company to come and ride for Tony Hawk's company, Birdhouse, and this will make some people mad if you're under 18. In England, you finish school when you are 15. So I tell all the young kids, save up your money, fly over there, graduate, and then start sharing Jesus, amen? So I finished school, went to art college, took off to America, was living in a house with all these skateboarders, my bills were paid, and in a nutshell, I've never had a job. All I did was I was skateboarding, I was touring the world, I was signing this, I was signing that within four or five years of just hanging out with everyone, being in the videos and the magazines, I'm professional. Your name's on shoes, your name's on the board, you're starting to make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, but who have you never heard about? Who have I never heard about? Jesus. I'm living for myself. I fell in love with skateboarding at 13, and at the age of 19, I fell in love all over again. Who do you think I fell in love with? No, I didn't meet Jesus yet. I fell in love with a woman from Huntington Beach who has an accent like you and drives on the wrong side of the road. And we were going out together for a very long time. That's my wife, my family right there. We were going out for a very long time, four months total, madly in love. And I said, babe, even though you drive on the wrong side of the road and you speak with an accent and I don't, and you play that funny sport called soccer, why don't we drive out to Vegas, get married, and have a family? I mean, life was going so good. I was living the American dream. There was a lot of money coming in. There was a lot of fame. There was a lot of attention. I knew nothing about responsibility. So we got an Honda Accord. We sped out there to Vegas. We got married, fell madly in love, and we knew nothing nothing about responsibility. So picture being in my position, everything you've ever wanted has come true. Everything is working out fine, all of your dreams are happening, but I don't know about God. Our love isn't even the agape love, our love is selfish love. If we don't have God, the kind of love that you're gonna have is like this. You're gonna love someone because of the way they look or the way they make you feel. You're gonna really love yourself and that's how our love is. So within just two years of fighting and bickering, and statistics say that most marriages fail within what? Two years, we began to fight. We began to say, you're not the right one. You're the wrong person for me. The right one's out there. We don't have a clue about life. Why don't we get divorced? Why don't we do this? Why don't we do that? And so there's Brian with a bunch of money, living the American dream, not knowing about Jesus, suddenly divorced from this woman. How many of you guys know people that have been divorced? This is part of society, this is part of the world we live in, there's pain, there's hurt, there's Brian with a beautiful ex-wife now, a beautiful son, separated, my kid's parents are separated and Brian's got no clue about God and I said, you know what God, I don't get any of this, I don't even know who you are, Buddha, Allah, the spaghetti monster, the Hindu God, the rest of far I got, I mean what's the difference? And here's what happened in my life, I said God, I've in a nutshell gained the whole world but lost my soul. If I just evolved, if I'm just some monkey, if I'm just some ape, I'm acting like it anyway. If life doesn't matter, I mean, why care about anything if we just evolved anyway? I said, God, whoever you are, I'm gonna prove that you're not real, and then I'm gonna end my life. And how many of you guys maybe know someone that's committed suicide or people that are suicidal? Maybe in here today, feeling that way, and Jesus can set you free, amen? But there's Brian with everything, gaining everything, all that glitters is gold, buying that stairway to heaven, so they say, but I have no clue about God. I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm overliving, and I begin to tell God, I'm gonna prove you're not real. I began to read the Quran, I began to read the Satanic Bible, I began to read these Hindu books, all these Buddhist books, I began to look at all these different religions, Mormonism, Jehovah Witness, and then God began to speak to me through what? The sword, the word of God. 
Right away in the beginning, Genesis 1, 26 and 27, God began to speak to me. You know what God says? He says, let us make man in our image. I was going to God to fix my life to help with my divorce, to help with my pain, to help with my finances. And God was speaking to me and saying, Brian, I made you in my image. If you're in here today and you don't know Jesus, you're made in the image of God. There is a plan, there is a purpose, you are special. God has set you apart for a reason. God began to speak to me. He began to speak in the Old Testament, how he spoke to Abraham and made a covenant with Abraham. You guys love Abraham or what? He said, through your seed, I'm gonna bless the nations. He began to reveal the Mosaic law 613 commandments that no one can keep. James says if we break the law in any one place, we're guilty of them all. God was beginning to speak to me about my sin and my struggle and my pain, but I was coming to God for my own reasons. And as I got to the New Testament, how many of you know God breaks it down in the New Testament? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1:14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Really, God? I'm over living. There's money coming in. I'm on tour with Tony Hawk and Bam Margera. You're signing autographs for six hours, but I don't have a clue about life. God was beginning to deal with me about the reality of life. He was beginning to speak to me. And as he was speaking to me, he was addressing the issue of sin. He's saying all of sin, then all of what? Falling short of the glory of God. Point of man to die once, and then judgment. God was speaking to me how he would come, he would live a perfect life. He would hang on a cross for all of my sin. He would rise again, and he would take off into heaven. And now, Brian, you can have eternal life, amen? That's the Lord that we serve. And as I was reading this, I was still making money. I was still fighting with this woman. We've been separated about a year now. And God put a man in my path called Christian Asoy, a skateboarder, a very famous skateboarder. He got out of prison, and he invited me to a church one night. Say, church, you guys follow me okay? Church, and he invited me to church one night, church. And the pastor there, he spoke on Galatians 5, on the flesh and the spirit. And he spoke on Matthew 7, 21, how many are gonna call Jesus Lord, but Jesus is gonna say, depart from me, I never knew you. And I heard that message that night. I'd bought a home, life was all about me. I'd encountered the scriptures, I'd believed in God, but I'd never met Jesus Christ. I went home that night, I got down on my knees. This is the craziest part of my testimony. I said, God, I believe that you're real. This is how crazy I was. I'd invited my ex-wife to live with me because I wanted to be together for our son. And so they're asleep in one room, and I go and I get down on my knees, and I said, God, I've been searching for you. I've been reading the Hebrew, I've been reading the Greek, I know you're real, I believe you sent Jesus. You said you'll give me the Holy Spirit, but God, I've never met you. And many people don't know God, but they say that they do. When you guys get cards at Christmas time, if I send you a card, you don't know me, you don't feel anything, right? But if you get something from your parents, you, fe- you feel the love, right? I hadn't felt that from God yet. And I went home that night, I said, God, I see my sin. I need to be saved, I need to be born again. God, can you save me? Can you change my life? And I prayed to God for 40 minutes. How many of you guys ever spent deep time with the Lord? Just you and Him? God was dealing with me that night. I came to him for all the wrong reasons and he was addressing where I was in need of a savior called Jesus Christ. I said, God, show up, save me. I'll give you my skateboarding. I'll go around the world. God, I'll get baptized. I'll even get remarried, amen. And this is the craziest part of my story is I felt in that instant as if this whole mindset that I have, loving Bruce Lee, Eastern philosophy, this whole Buddhist mentality. I felt like God walked in the room after seeking him and repenting and turning to him. And like the presence of God just hit me. And in one instant, there was joy. There was supernatural peace. All the pain was gone. Amen. And I sat there weeping and crying saying, I can't believe people don't know this is real. If you've been raised in the church, maybe you're so comfortable. Maybe you're coming here even as a Christian saying, well, I go to Christian university, but do you really get to walk with the Lord? Do you have that experience? Because for me, Jesus Christ showed up, amen? And if I can put that picture up again of my family, this is what happens. As I flew in yesterday on three planes, and I'm flying out today on three planes, and when I fly back, I'm flying back to that same woman, I'm remarried, amen? When I fly back, That's Tracy Robin Sumner. That's the girl that has a crazy accent like you and drives on the wrong side of the road like you. 
That boy next to her is Dakota Presley Sumner and his parents are together because of Jesus. A little girl, Eden Avery Sumner, she wouldn't be alive if it wasn't for Jesus Christ saving us and putting our marriage back together. That really big baby in the background that looks like Brock Lesnar that will take any of you out in wrestling and is gonna be the next Tim Tebow, amen? <laughs> Bible says the power of life and death is in the tongue and I'm believing and speaking it, amen? I don't know a thing about football, by the way. I just know that they wear a lot of padding. That's all I know. But look, those two children wouldn't be alive, wouldn't be my kids if it wasn't for Jesus. And so that brings me to the point today about where we are. God save me. You've heard a lot of testimonies. He did a work in my life. But what is his plan for your life? Why are you here? What is the goal? And 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you know this verse. It says, when we encounter Jesus, that what? All things pass away and all things become what? New. But why did things become new? Why did God save me and leave me here? Why is God saving you and leaving you here? Why aren't we taken? Proverbs 29, 29, 18, it says the people are perishing for lack of vision. I was perishing, but now I have vision. I once was lost, but now I'm what? I once was blind, but now I what? So why does Jesus leave us here? Why does Jesus have you in, you in Liberty University? Why does he have you in the biggest university that's Christian in the world? Why has he given you the gifts that you have? Why is he having me speak to you today about, yeah, it's a great testimony. We all have great testimonies. You haven't got to go as crazy as I went to need Jesus. You just need to be born into sin. But what is the plan for our life now? Proverbs 29, 18 says, the people perish for lack of vision, but I'm not perishing. I don't want to put this mindset before you. You guys have heard in the book of James how he says life is but a what? A vapor. And you know what we say? We say, well, life's crazy. Life's a vapor. Praise God I'm saved. But my question to us today is what about everyone else's vapor? What about everyone else that all of you from Liberty University are going to go out and play football with or play basketball with or play soccer with or encounter? What about their vapor? The people are perishing for what? Lack of vision, well, I'm not perishing now. I don't need to hear the gospel. They need to hear it. Life is but a vapor. What is the purpose of your life? What is the goal? What is central? Would we, we say it's Christ, but what do we mean? Listen, I'm not a guy that wants to get up and speak in front of however many thousand people that are here, but here's what Paul writes to the church in Ephesus. In Ephesians 2.10, if you don't know what your life is about, this is it. After he talks about us being saved, after he talks about the grace of God and our faith and saying this is not of ourselves that we boast, Jesus, through Paul, the Holy Spirit, tells us what life is about. Where you are, you're here today to hear the Lord say this to you. So as you continue to live for him, you're going to reach a lot of people. He says, for we are, say are, we are, that's you and I, believers. We are the workmanship of Christ. We're created in Jesus Christ, why Lord, for good works. I wouldn't come up here and speak. I'd be nervous, I'd be out of my mind to wanna do this. How can I come here and share with you? Because I'm the workmanship of Christ and I'm created in Christ Jesus for good works. And here's the great part for you. If you have a hard time making decisions, so many of you today, everything's thrown at you online. Everything's thrown at you how to be, how pretty to be, how good looking to be, how much money to make. He says we are his workmanship. We've been created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Why am I saying this? Why am I saying the people perish for lack of vision? Why am I saying life is just a vapor? Why am I saying that for you in here today, there is a work for you to do? Because for 24 years of my life, I lived in an area in California that was heavily populated by Christians. But even coming to California, no one told me about Jesus. Put yourself in this perspective. If you had met me 10 years ago when I was divorced, when I was suicidal, if I was to come into your office, if I was to come into your campus or to the basketball game last night, and I was to sit with you and say, man, my life is crazy. I'm divorced from this woman. There's a bunch of money in the bank. I'm over living. What would you say to me? What would you be eager to tell me? Would you say, he's perishing for lack of vision? Would you say his life's just a vapor? Would you say, I'm the righteousness of Christ, I'm given a work today to share this message? Because the reason I say this is because when I was going through so much pain and hurt, like many of you may be, or all of our friends out there in the world who don't know Jesus, I was around a lot of Christians, and I would ask them about my life. And here's some of the advice they'd give me. 
They'd say, go be with someone else. They'd say, just go out and have a few drinks. They'd say, maybe smoke some weed, chill out, don't be so intense, but I'm divorced and suicidal. If I came into your life and asked you those questions, what would you say? Because here's what happened to me. When I got saved, I went back to those people. I never knew they were Christians. And when I began to share Jesus with them, they said, it's cool, bro, I'm a Christian. I'm sitting in their office talking about my pain and hurt, but they didn't share Jesus. They were saying they were honoring Christ, but they weren't eager to share him. I was perishing for lack of vision. My life was just a vapor. As you're in here today, the reason God has gifted you and called you, the ultimate goal is to share the love of Christ and create who? Worshippers in the name of Jesus. Can we give it up for him, amen? I'm gonna drill home a simple point today. We are his workmanship. There's a work for you to do. The reason I can fly here is because I'm meant to stand right here. I'm meant to share Jesus and you're meant to listen so you can go and do what you need to do. This is what Jesus says in the Beatitudes in Matthew's gospel in 5.13. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Not you might be. He doesn't say try to be. He says, you are the salt of the earth. The Bible says a good tree bears good fruit. If you're in Christ, you are the salt. People need to hear from you. He says, you are the salt of the earth, but if, if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. And notice it says by men, not by Satan. He's saying, Liberty, Brian, you are the salt of the earth. You're to go out into all the world just to proclaim the gospel, but you might get trampled underfoot by men and you lose your flavor. And a lot of times in this passage, we focus on the salt. You guys ever heard a message on this? And we talk about the salt preserving. We talk about the salt saying we need Jesus, but what I wanna talk about is what does it mean when he says to you and I, you are the salt, but don't lose your flavor. The word for flavor, this is what it means. It means foolish or stupid. What Jesus is saying is, Brian, you're a Christian now, I've saved you, but if all you do is talk about your testimony, you might lose your flavor. You might not bear good fruit. This word that's used here is the same word used elsewhere where it says they thought themselves to be wise, but they were actually fools. What Jesus is saying is that you can lose your flavor. I'm not saying you're gonna lose your salvation, but I'm saying you could lose your flavor. When I walked into those skateboard companies, if I was sitting there talking to you, why didn't they wanna share Jesus? Was it because Brian was the big name pro? And if you tell me about your God that I can't see who loves me and died for me and the Holy Spirit has to show up, that I'm gonna think you're crazy or get you fired? Is it possible that when I was going through my pain and my life was just a vapor, that those Christians before me, and I'm not attacking them, I'm trying to encourage you today. I'm trying to think if I was to pass away and my three kids encountered any of you, are they gonna hear of the Lord? Are they gonna see the joy that you have in here when you're worshiping him? Because those people that I encountered, when I went back to tell them about Jesus, I was shocked. I was amazed that they didn't know and it blew my mind. I said, why wouldn't they just tell me? Was it because I'm a pro? Was it because the whole skate team would think they're goofy? How many of you guys know you're gonna be persecuted in the name, in the name of Jesus? You are, the Bible says it. In Acts 1 8, he says, you will have power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. The word for witnesses means martyr. You'll be hated when you talk about Jesus. So many times you wanna see the power of God move, the Holy Spirit, but how many of you guys know this? You have to step out in faith and make yourself vulnerable for God to use the Holy Spirit in your life, amen? There needs to be a comfort, there needs to, to be a help. So what we've gotta to say today is, do we wanna be the salt and the light? Do we care about other people's vapors? Do we wanna bear witness to other people? Back in 1959, there's a very famous comedian, you guys have all heard about him. He had a bowler hat, he had a mustache, and he had a cane. What was his name? You guys awake or what? Am I getting too serious for you? Because I love the word black and white. Charlie Chaplin, whoever said Charlie Brown, that was not Charlie Brown. You guys paying to come here? What are they teaching you? Charlie Chaplin, but here's what goes on. Charlie Chaplin is suddenly super famous. He's all over the world, he's known. This is a real word they use, it's called chaplinitis. Suddenly everyone wanted to look like Charlie Brown. They wanted to be like Charlie Brown. They wanted to dress like Charlie Brown. So one of the things they did was they held look-alike contests to be like Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown, you messed me up. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Hey, Charlie Brown preaches the gospel, right? 
speak the oracles of God, there's some fruit for him in heaven, some treasure. But they wanted to be like Charlie Chaplin, okay? And so they had these look-alike contests where people would go and try and be like Charlie. And so Charlie, being a comedian and being funny and getting publicity, you know what he did? He said, I'm going to go to some of these contests with my brother. And so it's speculated that he went over to Switzerland with his brother. He and his brother dressed up like Charlie Chaplin. And they entered this contest with all these people. And do you know what place he got? He got third. And you know who won? His brother. And then he came back, he went to San Francisco and he entered a contest and you know who won? Bob Hope won, Charlie Chaplin didn't even place. And now this is funny but the reality is people didn't even have a good understanding of what Charlie Chaplin really looked like because they were picking people that didn't look like him. And when I think of that, I think about our nation and I think about you and I as Christians and how we look at so many nations and we see them as all the same. You maybe see a nation where people are dark-skinned and we say, well, they're all Muslim or they're all Hindu. Or my wife's half Hispanic, so naturally she must be a Catholic. But all those other nations, they look to us and you know what they say? They say, you're all Christians. The people that are ripping off the IRS, they think they're Christians. The people that are molesting kids, they think they're Christians. Any person in this room, they think you're a Christian. And what I see from the Charlie Chaplin story, what I see from looking at these nations is that for you and I, Jesus is serious when he says, let us be the salt. When he says, let us be the light. If you want to be like Charlie Chaplin, what do you do? You get a mustache, you walk funny, you wear a cane, you do what Charlie did. If you want to be as Jesus is, you got to walk as Jesus did, amen? And right now, I don't know if you guys are seeing this, but people want to preach this gospel that's not the gospel. They want to do all these good works without the cross and without repentance. When I think of Mother Teresa, God bless her, but I think of helping peaceful and hurting children. When I think of Bono, I think about world peace, but when I think about Jesus, I think of repentance. The Bible says John the Baptist came preaching, K. Russo, repent. It says from that time on, Jesus came preaching, repent. The first message ever given was Peter that day, and the people said, what should I do? And Peter said, repent. And 3,000 people were transformed because Peter said, repent from your sin. It wasn't until someone addressed me the issue of my sin that their salt had flavor. If those people in the shoe company would have stopped me and said, Brian, it's great that you want a better life, but Jesus died for you. You need to turn from your sin. My life could have been transformed earlier, amen. What am I speaking to liberty today? is that you are blessed to be here. It's just as Ian's telling me about this campus, I'm like, Matt, I want my kids to be here. I mean, the CEO of Walmart, you guys are having Mark Driscoll come speak. Don't waste your time here. Don't waste what God is sowing into you because if I could have been raised somewhere like this, I would have all the ammunition to be as flavored as the salt and the light in the well as I could. Just give it up for your university, amen. And I want to finish on the last few minutes. I'm just going to quote some scripture. But here's what happens is we see Jesus showing us this. In John's gospel in chapter 4, we have the story of Jesus. And he's going to a place called Galilee. And Galilee is pretty close. But what happens is Jesus takes the disciples out of the way to a place called Samaria. And he encounters what we now call the what? The story of the Samaritan woman. And here's some verses what takes place. It says, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Why are they going there? To share Jesus. Where did the disciples go? They went to buy food. Jesus comes to her, asks her about water, and begins to relate. In verse 10, it says, Jesus answers and says to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would want this living water. He's beginning to point to himself being the Messiah. He's beginning to flavor it with salt. Where are the disciples right now? They're off getting food. They're not being flavored. In verse 14, he says, whoever drinks of this water that I will give him or her will never thirst. And here's what takes place. Jesus shows up. He shares that he's the Messiah. He points to the Old Testament. He shares the word of God. Isaiah said, when the word goes out, it never attains void. And now the woman in Samaria hears the gospel and she wants to receive it. In verse 15, the woman says, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus could have just said, be saved, be born again, just believe. But look at what Jesus does. He addresses the issue of her sin. It says, Jesus said to her, go and call your husband and come here. 
We would look at that and say, well, that's rude. Don't bring up their sin. I'm not saying bring up people's sin. What I'm saying is address the issue of repentance. Address the issue of the cross because the cross then becomes all powerful. Amen. I said many prayers but never encountered Jesus because no one told me about sin. And he says, you've had five husbands. She gets it. The Bible says the truth will set you free. I'm rushing right now. Here's what happens at John 4, 31. It says, in the meantime, his disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat. The disciples were off eating. They were off at McDonald's. They were off at the coffee shop. They were off doing their own thing. But Jesus had brought them there to share the gospel. And now Jesus is the one being the salt and the light. Jesus is the one encountering Brian. Jesus is the one encountering your friends. It says, in the meantime, his disciples urged him saying, Rabbi, eat. And Jesus said to them, and you're going to see the rebuke now. He says, I have food to eat of which you do not know. The food that I am eating, he's saying, you don't understand. I brought you to Samaria to minister the gospel, but you were busy about your own food. And I went to the woman at the well. I invited her to have the living water. I'm the one that shared repentance and the power of God. And now they come to him saying, what's he talking about? And my favorite verse in scripture, one of them, is John 4:34. When Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. People are perishing for lack of vision. Life is just a vapor. You are all the workmanship of Christ created. And Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him. How many of you guys pray this prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. You ever prayed that? What we're saying is God provide for us, but give us what we're called to do. And then Jesus says to them, I sent you to reap for which you have not labored, Others have labored and now have entered into their labors. Jesus is saying to them, I put before you somewhere to labor and you're more focused on yourselves. You're more caught up, Brian. You're more caught up in your skating. You could be more caught up in your academics. And here's the crazy verse for me. Jesus went there to minister to Samaria. He spoke to one woman. It says in John 4, 39, after the woman goes into the city and many of the Samaritans of the city believed in him because of the word of the what? The woman, Jesus sent them to go preach and they didn't preach. Jesus saved one woman and she went into the city and ministered. I'm a little bit over time, but here's what I wanna say to us today. There's people in your life that are perishing for lack of vision. If I could have been here 10 years ago, the message I would have wanted to hear is how God saved a filthy, wretched sinner skateboarder and how he's called him to go into all the world, which is the greatest call in your life, amen? Liberty University is here to help you minister the gospel, your professors and the people that serve you. God has blessed you to be empowered to serve him. I wanna just say this, don't allow someone else to minister for you. A woman who'd just been saved shared the gospel, but Jesus had sent them there. And here's all I wanna do for us before we just close. Just bow your heads for a moment. I heard a guy say one time, you can't assume that you're radical because people around you aren't. I don't know what your gifting is, but God does. I don't know if there's crazy sin in your life, but God does. I don't need to know these things. What I wanna do is bless us and pray over us and believe that God's gonna just speak to us and use us. If you're in here today and you're in a place that you wanna leave some stuff with the Lord, I'm just gonna ask you to, to raise your hand in a moment and say, God, I'm ready to serve you. If you're somewhere here today and maybe you don't feel like you've been that salt that you would share with the Brian Sumner when he shows up, that you would share with the dead people around you, I wanna pray that God would just encourage you today. If that's you in here on the count of three, would you just raise your hand as I pray so I can just see? Amen. Lord, we thank you today, God, for all that you do. God, for the precious blood of the cross, for the, for the work of the Holy Spirit, but God, that you give us stories like this, not to chastise us, but to show us your grace and mercy. God, you've got a harvest for us to reap and you've sent us out into the well and you're right here, Lord, manufacturing your own people to be mighty in the name of Jesus, great athletes great scientists, great professors. Lord, I just speak life today over us all, that God, you've empowered us, you've sent us, Lord, that where there's sin, where there's struggle, where there's pain, they would press in, and that, Lord, we would see so much fruit because of the work that you're doing in us and through us. In the name of Jesus, we pray and we say, amen. Awesome, you guys, God bless you. <laughs>